Thanks very much, Jen. And Mads, that's, thanks very much for that talk. Um, what I'm going to present here is very much complementary to that. You've got maybe a little bit more data than this, maybe a little bit ahead, but um, we've also borrowed the term short-term risk from your work and from the KARMA study, the, the risk of interval cancers but cancer at the next screen at two years. So we have a very similar screening program in Australia than in Scandinavia. Um, this work has been done by a thing called the BRAKES team, B-R-A-I-X, and Helen Fraser this morning, who's leading that ra radiologist, uh, presented on the work that's been done. And there's a whole team of AI people. You have one PhD student, we have three or <laughs> five, and have come up with their own version of Transpara, which we call BRAKES. And a, a group of us here, Michael Elliott, who just asked the question there, has been very instrumental in bringing this all together, this massive database we're going to talk about. And Kevin Wynn and Osama al Kershi from our group have also been major players in trying to pull together this story. We take a slightly different approach, but we're basically finding the same thing. Um, so I like to think about risk scores um, and being normally distributed and with zero mean and a standard deviation of one. So they can anchor my epidemiological thinking. And the basic epidemiological model is that risk increases multiplicatively, multiplicatively across that score. It gets a bit more complicated. You can have a logistic function if you want to, but it's the same sort of story. And it also seems to be a fact of biology that if you transform scores to normality and look at risk, then it tends to be multiplicative. Um, God has designed the world in a strange way. She really has. Um, and so this is an underlying way of looking at data. And the key element is not the AUC. The, the AUC is there, but I don't believe people really understand AUCs, but they all quote it, and you have to quote it. We get forced to quote it. But the real thing is the risk gradient across that scale. And that is represented strangely by a symbol called delta. Now, why delta? So the risk is e to the delta times the risk score. Delta turns out to be the log odds ratio per standard deviation of the risk score. And that I call the log opera. The A there is so that you don't believe that I named it after myself. Um, but the A there is critical because you adjust everything to have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And this is critical in mammographic density because we have this awful negative confounding with age and BMI. And people don't realise that they've actually adjusted for age and BMI. They've transformed to a nail to a risk score scale. So if you're thinking about risk, think about it on this scale. And there's a simple formula you see there that the AUC is a function of the delta but it's, that's the cumulative distribution function of the normal distribution. And I'll show you what that looks like later. So you can always flip back between the equivalent AUC, but the delta, and in particular the log opera, or the opera, is a way to think about the risk gradient. Now, the, we talked about the polygenic risk scores earlier in this meeting. Polygenic risk scores are made of measuring a whole lot of genetic markers across the genome hundreds, even thousands of them, and they're each associated with, don't necessarily cause, a small increment of risk. And when you put all these together, lo and behold, what you find in these beautiful uh, normal distributed risk scores with a multiplicative risk gradient across it, it's sort of wonderful to see <laughs> that. And so how good is the polygenic risk score from th hundreds of thousands of cases controlled, billions of dollars, lots of Nature Genetics papers? Well, the answer is that the delta is 0.5. And the delta is the amount that you move the case distribution away from the control distribution. And why is it delta? Well, there's a thing called Cohen's D you might read about in the psychological literature. This concept's been around forever. And so D is delta, and it's how much you move the cases and controls apart in terms of a standardised normal risk score. So this is a way of anchoring all our thinking about risk scores. And our whole set of research excellence is about combining risk scores. This is what detection looks like. This is what Transpira is looking like. This is what the, the, um, the model that the Brakes Group are looking like. 
moving the distribution around, say, for example, three standard deviations, you get an AUC of 0.98. And that's pretty impressive, but you still see that there's still an overlap down there of cases and controls, that, that little gap in the middle. They're not perfectly... You have to get out to five or something like that if you really want to do perfect detection or near-perfect detection. There's no such thing as perfect detection. Now, combining risk scores is really interesting because people talk about change in AUC, but the change in AUC depends on where you start from and who, what you've got in the model. So it's not an invariant thing. So you put lousy things in to start and you make big changes in AUC. You put terrific things in at the end and they hardly make a difference. And that's what basically holds back science, that paradigm. But if you peel it apart and look at the log opera, you see that they don't add. I thought Gillian had done it all wrong. I had redo analysis and then I realised she was right, I was wrong, that the, the deltas combined like the size of a right angle triangle because you, it's about moving away from zero. And if you do it in two dimensions and you go this one, one, delta one in one direction and delta two in the other direction, you've moved it by the square root of delta one squared plus delta two squared. Hello, Pythagoras. Isn't he wonderful? <laughs> What a great theorem. So now we can talk about how much it makes a difference to add extra risk scores. And now we get to Einstein's theory, which is the faster you go, the harder it is to go faster. And the problem is the better you predict risk, the harder it is to do better. So um, we've got some very important theorems coming into play here. Uh, so that's the, what the AUC and the delta looks like and you see it's almost linear down the bottom side of the curve so you can flip-flop between the two if you like to but I like to think in terms of the risk gradient now transforming breast cancer screening with AIX with, with AI sorry artificial intelligence is the MRF funded grant that we've had for the last two years that has led to um, these breakthroughs in learning about detection. So just like the Yada et al. papers and the people behind Transpara, people have compared images of affected breasts with images of unaffected breasts, mostly from unaffected women. And this is not what we've been doing in mammographic density world. We have been taught very seriously by Norman Boyd, we are not allowed to look at the affected image we are to look at the opposite breast for a woman who has breast cancer. We're looking at something intrinsic about the woman. So we have been doing a whole lot of work about making inference about women. The AI people have come along and made inference about images. And it's different. They're looking at detection. We're looking at inherent risk. And what the excitement is, is that what they're learning from AI is actually telling us about risk. And that's why mammographic density is that, incredibly, by applying, having digital mammograms, con convoluted <laughs> neural networks and all the rest of it, the gee wizardry, the black boxes, is actually telling us something about risk and your question, what does it mean biologically? Well, that's a fabulous question, but that's no reason we know the answer at this stage. It's suddenly opened up a whole new door. So... This data set consists of, as you see, four million images from over a million women or women, a million episodes from more, over half a million women attending breast screen over the last decade. An incredible resource that Helen and Breast Screen Victoria have put together. Uh, this is just some numbers to impress you with, the, it's thanks to Michael. Um, but this is an extraordinary database and it's got annotations, it's got breast screen data, it's got stuff about radiologists, it's, you know, it's a gold mine. And we've just started to dig. And what's been created, what we've created is what we call the BREAKS mammogram risk score. And the BREAKS score is devised from what the artificial intelligence people have learnt and they learn a probability, and that's what's behind that transpire score. Those transpire scores of one to nine or whatever, they are deciles, approximately. But this goes even further than that. That goes right down to a probability to have an enemy decibel point you like. But then we, did, we transformed it. We did a logit transformation, and then we looked at it, and it was skewed, so we cube root transformed it, and then we adjusted for age, because 
the IO people wanted to have age, and I said epidemiologists, we always control for age. But So we adjusted for age because that's what epidemiologists do. So we're taking into account a woman's age. That's a whole other dimension that can be added to our risk scores. But for the moment, and then of course we standardised with mean zero and variance one. And we also, from this big data set, took out a sub-cohort. We did not use this 20% sub-cohort for any of the, of the learning, any of the AI work. So it's within the same population sampling, but it's not being used to discover anything. So it's a true testing replication independent data set, at least in the context of breast screening in Victoria. And that was built out of the people who came in in 2015 and 2016, so we can follow them up for two years. And we're actually keeping on following them up, so hopefully we'll have long-term data down, down the track. And so we have outcomes, different outcomes. And the first outcome is actually detection at the time of the screen. The second one is interval cancers. And because there's a linkage between Breast Screen Victoria and the Cancer Council of Victoria, those, um, in time, we can find those interval cancers. Um, we can't find the actual mammograms yet, but we know the mammograms that were taken before they became interval cancers. And now we actually have also at two years screening because that's at Marnie 3, so we have their, what we call our short-term outcome, which is either an interval or a cancer at the next screen. And this is what this breaks risk score distribution looks like. So there you see on the, the left-hand side is what we call the control. That's the population, and it's beautifully normal, and it has a standard deviation of one. Now we look at what it is for those who are actually detected at baseline, and you see that they're not just moved down the scale, they're moved as a whole, which is quite fascinating. There's, anything could have happened here, but it looks like this whole distribution has picked itself up and moved about two to three standard deviations. It isn't, has got a slightly bigger standard deviation in one, but for all intents and purposes, it's just moved. This is what happens when we look at the short-term cancers. This is interval plus two years. Again, the controls are normal, not one. And the short-terms have also picked up and moved. This time they've moved by mm, a bit less than one standard deviation. But they've moved as a group, so you can see that um, it's not just at the top end that the whole distribution has moved. So our multiplicative model works here. And these are the numbers, so you can actually see that we've divided these break scores into less than minus two and on the way down. Now, when to, the way to interpret those break scores, zero is the mean. That's like five on the transpiral scale. And plus or minus one is about two thirds of the women. That's plus or minus one standard deviation. We know that about two and a half percent are in over two standard deviations from the mean. So we can interpret this break score under normal theory. And you can, you can see the percentages there in the at-risk group. And then you look down detected, so you can see that less than minus one, no one's detected. And it gets up to less than zero. That's 50% of the women it's only seven out of the 461 were detected there. So that's half the women screening have a break score, which tells you that they're virtually um, not going to have cancers. You'll miss one or two, seven, <laughs> in this, this sub subset of um, 100,000 women, 90,000 women. And then away it goes, and you see once you get to the high break scores, it hits 100%. Then we take the detected women out of the equation and now we look at the women who are at risk, it's just slightly less. And now we look at the short term. And again, you see the short term, it is going up as you go down the scale. And rather than, that's just to show you the numbers, but um, what I will do is show you what the actual predictions are. And they're the predictions. And the break score scales on the bottom, the detected are the one that goes along and then shoots up to 100%. They're the ones about detection. But now you see that when you get up to about two standard deviations or a bit below, then you start to see this increased risk of short-term cancers. So remember, two standard deviations, about 2.5% are in the tail. Um, we're really talking about the tails, 
but we're seeing very interesting things going on. Now, this is really difficult because I want to go backwards, and I'm not sure how you go backwards. Red arrow. Red arrow. I'm too scared to hit the red arrow. <laughs> there it is. Okay. So when we go back and we fit our model, our nice statistical model, and we fit our opera, you see that the opera is 16. There's a 16-fold increase risk per standard deviation about detection, and it is highly significant. And it's equivalent to an AUC of 0.98. And that's what we observe. But it doesn't really matter what the AUC is. It's what's matter on the left-hand side of the ROC curve. So AUCs are completely deceptive. Um, you change the distribution, you can do all sorts of things. But what matters is the very start of the AUC, of the ROC curve. The, <clears throat> the short term is across the whole range, though. We push the whole population. And it's 2.3 per standard deviation or an AUC of 0.72. And that looks very familiar with the work that Mads has just shown us. That there's some extra information in here. We're not quite sure what it is, but it's predicting short-term cancers. And remember, I showed you what the polygenic risk score and the, the opera is 1.65. So it's nowhere near 2.3. The um, Now... Um, Mads has just talked about this. This was a publication before that uh, from his PhD student. And there's the sort of data that Mads has just been talking about. There's the transpara scores, bin 1 to 10. And there they are in terms of predicting breast cancer. And there's the AUC 0.97, exactly the same as we found. Um, and now Mads is showing us some brand new data, which is fantastic. Um, there is a Dutch study which was published last year as well, this time focusing just on interval cancers. And they used Transpara and they got an you know, AUC of 0.73. You can't rig this to get all these numbers so similar. They got the same story. They also used Libra as a measure of mammographic density. Remember, this is interval cancers and it's well known that mammographic density is a strong predictor of interval cancers and the opera is about two. Oh, it's exactly two. We get that all the time. <laughs> then they said, well, what if we put this together? And then they went and got AI to combine the two score, which seemed incredible to me. And I can't understand it, but they should have just fit the two factors because they're actually independent of each other. The, the, the transpiral score is not correlated with the density score. And that little bit of calculations at the bottom there shows that by applying the hypotenuse rule that I predicted what they'd get when they combined that it's exactly what they got. They didn't need to apply AUC to combine it, they just needed to combine them as risk factors. So we haven't yet put density into our model and that's coming up. We're learning density using AI and Osama al is doing this work for us. Um, Kevin and his group have done um, cumulus measurements by, by hand for hundreds of thousands of women. And we're using that to then learn, the computer's learning how it can reproduce density at least reasonably well. So we can now hopefully apply this new tool to the 100,000 women we've got in the sub cohort and save Kevin a lot of time and energy. <laughs> and my prediction is that this will, of course, just like the Danish study, this will add to the prediction, the short term prediction. And Mads, I think, is already doing that as well from the sounds. So the point is that we're now getting incredibly good prediction, short-term prediction. And so we can now look at it. It may, may be long-term prediction as well that the data is starting to show. We're going to hear about the Karma study as well. But all of a sudden it's opened, the AI has opened a door to us. The Yala et al. papers were deceptive because they were confusing detection with risk after the screening, uh, they were talking about, you know, they, they got the epidemiology wrong. But the bottom line is true, that the AI is for detection is telling us something about risk that can be used to transform screening. And it's fascinating to hear the discussion that's been going on in, in Copenhagen <laughs> about how to handle this. We had, we've had a day and a half now of discussion about what to do about this information here in, in Australia. So I think that's the end of the story. Yeah. So major implications for screening. Thank you.